I did some review last time, and right at the end we made a Lewis structure. Now, to, to do the rest of the chapter where I'm going to pick up today, you have to be able to draw Lewis structures. Okay, does that make sense, you guys? You have to be able to see, well, actually you really need a 3D mental picture of the molecules. It really helps. Okay, sometimes even a model kit is the way to do things, but we can visually see it in a two-dimensional drawing on the board. But I, I've got a, a couple molecules on the board, and I want to start using some words. <clears throat> One of those molecules is symmetrical, and the other is asymmetrical. Okay, what do I mean by that? One's the same on both sides, and one has differences on both sides. Now, there's even more to it than that. We've talked about polarity, right? Um, but from a, not polarity, but of uh, atoms which have electronegativity, right? And so if I look at the electronegativity of fluorine and I compare that to something over here on the left side of the periodic table, anything, then is fluorine more electronegative or electropositive? It's more electronegative and that, well, metal ions, they only make positive ions, don't they? Okay, you guys with me? And so, in fact, there's a relationship there that we call, well, what is a bond between a metal and a non-metal? It's ionic, right? And in fact, we consider that the positive element gives up its electron to the negative element, right? And so that those coexist as two magnets. You guys with me? And so those are strong magnets and they form what's called a covalent bond and that solid then is called a salt, right? You guys with me? So that's just language. And so those salts are sticky, those two magnets, the plus and the minus, they stick together. Well, there's actually some molecules that are more like the refrigerator magnets, right? Do they, are they really powerful magnets? No, they're really weak, aren't they? And so more like a refrigerator magnet are these molecules that are with two elements that are closer in electronegativity, right? So instead of being metal, non-metal, they're both non-metals, okay? And, but instead of ionically bonding, what do they do? What's the name of the bond? Covalent. covalent bonds, right? So they form covalent bonds between them, but one of them is a bully and one of them's not. That's the way I look at it. What's the biggest bully? Fluorine, okay? And then if I move left or I move down, then they become less electronegative, right? You guys with me? And so I have to pay attention to that when I start looking at molecules, right? And I have those nonpolar bonds, which they're identical and they're, they're um, what they are, or they're symmetrical, okay? Even though they have different charges, Right, or electronegativities, if it's fully symmetrical, well, it's gonna be over there on that nonpolar side, okay? Now, when I get asymmetry in two elements, which are nonmetals bonded together, then they make what's called a polar molecule. Now, gosh, guys, I can't talk about all the things in the real world that become important because of this. How about proteins? The proteins have charged polar places on them and nonpolar places and even ionic places yeah and then those actually fold up right to do function proteins are many machines whether you realize it or not okay i i know it's not proof all right but that there's a message coded to build that machine and that that machine works Hey, when I see a cell phone, do I think something built that or do I think that it just accidentally happened? Something built it. Proteins are the same way they have function, okay? So, nah, I don't know. There's no way to prove that though, right? That an intelligent designer did that. We don't have a way to do that, okay? But in my mind, mm, I think so, okay? Just because of the complexity there. It's irreducible. All right, so anyway, so polar versus nonpolar. Now, the way those really, we would draw this, right, is we would just put a CL and a CL, right? You guys with me? So it wouldn't have the beautiful reds and blues and all those other things. 
And then the second one is HCl, right? And in fact, the difference in the charge on these two, right? If we go back and we look at the, uh, there's an equation which does that, this bond is actually ionic in nature, even though we call it covalent, okay? So we might go back and review that here in a minute, okay? So anyway, but what, what I want to say with that is that this is a covalent molecule when it's not in water, but what happens when I put this in water? Anybody know? What does it make? Hydrochloric acid, you guys ever heard of that? Yeah, HCl, another name for it, right? And so these disassociate, in fact, this is a strong acid and it disassociates completely. Okay, you guys with me? And so the water, well, wait a minute, why does water stabilize the charges on these? H plus and Cl minus. Because it's polar. So let's draw the structure of water, right? And so if we do that, everybody knows how to do this one, right? And I've done it so many times that it's unreal in this class, right? And so if I'm looking at this molecule, then this is the molecular structure, isn't it? It's bent. But what else actually coexists with this that I didn't draw? There's electrons, right? And so there's two ears out here that have pairs of electrons. I mean, that's the way we draw it, right? The rabbit ears. And so these rabbit ears are negative, right? And which makes the hydrogens positive asymmetry, right? You guys see the asymmetry there? Yeah. And so, well, the same thing with that. And so that's what we're really looking for is number one, elements of different um, electronegativity <coughs> and then asymmetry, okay? How about, let me draw another molecule, then we'll go through the slides. I'll, I'm just gonna do a couple here. Let's, um, let's do carbon and chlorine, okay? So, carbon tetrachloride, polar or non-polar? Non-polar. Non-polar, but wait a minute, isn't chlorine much more electronegative than carbon? It is, yeah. Then, then why is this molecule non-polar? It's symmetrical, right? What shape is this? Tetrahedral. It's tetrahedral, right? There's four things attached. It's an sp3 hybrid. If you want to go back to molecular orbitals, we talk about those at the end of the semester, right? And so there's four equal orbitals. These are as far apart as possible if we use Vesper, right? Um, so valence shell electron pair repulsion, right? And so when we look at that, then that's symmetrical. So you have to be able to see that, right? in terms of a molecule. Shapes that do not cancel polarity. So that's a shape that does cancel polarity. How about this one? Polar, well first, let me ask first, what shape is that? It's BH3, no lone pairs. AX3E, trigonal planar, right? The bond angles are 120 degrees, right? 360 degrees in a circle, okay? So now I ask you, polar or non-polar? Symmetrical or asymmetrical? You think so? So I've got a pull from three fluorines, right? Right? So I tie three forces of the exact same size, right? exact same strength to a rubber tire and I send them at 120 degrees pulling with the same force. Is any horse going to win? No. Non-polar. The polarity is canceled out. Yes, fluorine is much more electronegative than boron. Okay, you guys with me? But because the pull is in equal strength and a symmetrical direction that it cancels out, right? Vectors, gosh, I hate vectors. How many people hate vectors? 
Oh, I shouldn't say that because that, that just ruins Fitz's life. Vectors are fun, okay? So it's all a, of an opinion, isn't it? Right, I'll get somebody who will make a comment on that, I'm sure. Um, how about this molecule? So this is, so if we, we do, you know, and I'm gonna write this in this way, right? Um, CH2Cl2, can you tell whether this is symmetrical or asymmetrical from the formula? Yeah, I mean, yes, if you can mentally draw it, can't you? You have to, you have to think about that. So, well, let's actually do the Lewis structure, right? And now in reality, this is what? What's the shape of the molecule? Tetrahedral. It's tetrahedral, right? No lone pairs. So AX4E0, right? You guys with me? And when I'm looking at that, are these more electronegative than the carbon and the hydrogen? Yes, and so that means, well, in fact, which is the least electronegative? Hydrogen. The hydrogen, and so that means that this part of the molecule is going to be positive, right? And so we have a partial positive charge up on, this is another signage, right? You can use the arrow um, with the plus sign, or you can use uh, a partial differential sign and a negative charge on the other end. So, polar or nonpolar? Polar. This is a little magnet, isn't it? Okay. This is a magnet. And so, well, in fact, it's showing the net dipole up there for the molecule and the arrow off to the right. Okay, you guys with me? All right. So this is just giving water at the very top, showing the net dipole there. The CF4, would it be exactly the same as the CCL4? It is, isn't it? So it would be nonpolar. Are you starting to see those? I hope you are. All right. But if I take one of those fluorines off, so I take my scissors, cut it off, and I put a hydrogen in place of it, do I lose my symmetry? And so now I become what? Polar. Polar. Okay. Now, I'm gonna ask a second question. Is that gonna affect how those two different molecules behave? Is it gonna affect their properties? Yeah. Yeah. It is, isn't it? Which one of those, I'm gonna ask you a predictive question. Which one of those will have the highest boiling point? Which one will need more energy to vaporize? The middle one or the bottom one? Well, is uh, something that's non-magnetic easier to pick up or something that's magnetic stuck on a steel plate? Do what? So the one, the middle one still? No, the bottom one's gonna be have a higher boiling point, or wait a minute, take more energy. Lower boiling point is what I should have said, shouldn't it? I said that backwards, didn't I? Oh my gosh, right? So the, the temperature at which, no, I, I said it right. The CF4 will be a gas before the one on the bottom, right? Because it's sticky. Sticky things don't want to come apart. Okay, you guys with me? All right, so predictive. So structure, all of a sudden we can predict things from structure, okay? In fact, that's what allows us to predict how chains of polypeptides will fold up, right? Because of those charges, right? This is an interesting thing, right? Polar molecules will even align in a charge field, okay? And so if I put in um, positive on one side of the container and negative on the other, then those molecules will align. In fact, in techniques like electrophoresis or capillary electrophoresis, I can actually cause flow of molecules based on charge, okay? Now there we're getting beyond polar, nonpolar things don't move uh, in a field, right? You guys with me? So uncharged things don't separate unless you do some other chemistry. 
So anyway, all right. So dipole moment. So dipole is defining how big that mag, how strong that magnet is. Right? You guys with me? And so these dipole moments explain that. So if I'm looking at H2, I'm going to ask structure on that. Polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar. Nonpolar. And what's its dipole? It's zero, isn't it? Okay, you guys with me? But if I move down one, I have hydrogen and fluorine. Polar or nonpolar? Polar. polar. And it has a, well, comparably, is that a pretty large dipole? It is, isn't it? Right? And so if I move down one, HBR, right, is the dipole is 0.79. Now, I, I want to point out that I'm starting at fluorine, right? Which is very electronegative. When I move to bromine, is it less electronegative? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So realize that that's why that value diminishes. You guys got the hang of this? So the lower one here is going to be more less electronegative. That is true, yes. So that's a trend we learned last semester that I'm hoping will stick. See, we're reviewing that right now. So, yeah. All right. CO2. What's the structure of CO2? Let's draw that. That's a good, that's a good Lewis structure to practice right now. Okay, that's a good Lewis structure to practice. Is that bent like water? It's three atoms. That was kind of sarcasm, right? Did you guys catch the underlying in there? How many electron system is it? I heard a number, but I couldn't tell what it was. 16, is that right? Each oxygen has how many valence shell electrons? Six, how many of them are there? Two, that's 12 plus four, that's 16. Yep. That's that's correct. What's the center atom? All the oxygens are happy. Is that what it's going to be? No, because the carbon's not happy, right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to make. A, I'm going to take this lone pair of electrons. I'm going to put it in a, a bonding relationship. I'm going to steal one from over here. I'm going to put that in a bonding relationship. And so now, if I'm looking at this, let's do the axe on it. What is it? On the carbon. A X two E zero. Right? And when I have AX2E0, it's linear. Okay? So that means that I have two horses on either side of this hitched up and they're pulling equally in, er in both directions. So what's the dipole moment? You guys get the connection now? That's what I'm trying to build. Okay? So it becomes more difficult. It's easy when I just have two things, isn't it? Because I can just look up and see if they're different in electronegativity, and, and those are real easy. But when I start making molecules, and all of a sudden, the arrangement becomes very important, doesn't it? Okay. How about drawing pneumonia? How about drawing pneumonia? This is good review in my mind. You guys practice these. I think we did both of these when we were drawing those structures.
What did I leave off? I left off a lone pair. Now, do we commonly do that once you learn how to draw those structures? It is. It's, it, they're there. We just leave them off. It, when we're doing structure, it's a lot easier to put those on there because then you see them and they visually occupy space, right? You guys with me? But now if I'm just doing a reaction, I don't often put those on. Okay? Does that make sense? If I'm just structurally drawing the reaction. Right? But anyway, so... Well, what's the ax on this one? AX3 E1. Okay, there's one lone pair of electrons. So, do the lone pair of electrons affect this structure? Do they make it asymmetrical? Yes, right? So, this lone pair of electrons, right, can participate in that relationship. And so, is this part of the molecule negative or positive? Negative. It's negative. Is this part of the molecule negative or positive? positive? Positive. And so, it has a net dipole from positive to negative, right? You guys with me? Okay. What about the one right below it? NCl3. Why, I wonder why that electronegativity difference is so much larger on the hydrogens. Does the pole on the chlorines change the relationship? Yeah. And so a lone pair of electrons is electronegative, right? You guys with me? But the chlorines are more electronegative than the hydrogen, right? And so the dipole becomes less because of that, okay? So, structure. Now, in this and in these ideas, uh, this chapter also goes into bond energy. We've done this. Um, we actually have looked at bond energy and the relationship. The attractiveness between the two atoms is what determines that bond strength, right? And so to break one of those bonds, to pull them apart, right, takes energy. You guys with me? And so now I have a question. If I have two nonpolar uh, molecules and I put them together, are there any attractive forces between them? Yeah. There, there are, and they're actually called, there's a name for them. Anybody know what they are? London dispersion forces, right? And so those are considered weak forces, right? Where covalent bonds are considered strong forces for atoms. Now, when we look at the energy related to uh, moving a car, I mean, we're done breaking a whole bunch of those bonds to do that, right? To provide the energy to, to move the car, okay? But to look at one, then the bond energy between a carbon and hydrogen bond is much greater than it takes to pull two nonpolar molecules apart, right? But then if I instead have a nonpolar molecule, instead of a nonpolar, a polar molecule, right? Does the energy to pull those two molecules apart increase? Yeah, for the same size molecule, the, because the magnetic forces the, between the pluses and minuses are greater than just the rearrangement of electrons to cause partial positive and negative charges, okay? And so there's a relationship there. And in fact, there's some even stronger forces, right, that are from polarity, but it only is with uh, three atoms and hydrogen. Anybody know what that, that relationship or stickiness is called? Ever heard of hydrogen bonding? Yeah. And what three elements does hydrogen bonds work with? Oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen. Nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine and hydrogen, those four elements participate in hydrogen bonding, okay? So they're the only ones polar enough, right? And have those lone pairs available to do that, okay? Now, I was talking about those, wait a minute, let's look at this molecule, polar or nonpolar? It's methane CH4, nonpolar. And so when I have two methanes and they're together, right? <laughs> the amount of energy at the temperature this experiment was done at, probably standard state, is 8.9 kilojoules per mole, right? To pull them apart. 
and to break my carbon hydrogen bond, right? It's 414 kilojoules per mole. Is that a little bit bigger? So on the same size molecule, right? And the different relationships in that molecule, right? To take two of those, pull them apart, 8.9 kilojoules per mole, to actually rip a hydrogen off 414 kilojoules per mole. Cool? Yeah. All right. So what I was introducing were London forces, dipole-dipole forces, and hydrogen bonding, okay? So those are three non-covalent forces, and in things of the same size, those energies are all less than covalent relationships in terms of that, okay? Now, don't get me wrong, some hydrogen bonds can approach the equivalent energy of some covalent bonds. You guys with me? Or London forces for very large molecules, right? What's a place where a very nonpolar molecule is a solid at room temperature? Dairy industry? Butter, right? Those are very long nonpolar molecules, right? Fat, and yet butter's a solid at room temperature, okay? Yeah, a mushy solid, I know. But put it in the fridge, what happens? Does it get hard? Yeah. So what, why did we make margarine? So we could still keep it in the refrigerator and be soft enough to spread. Actually, originally it was supposed to be healthier, but that's a whole nother story, okay? So it wasn't. All right. Um, yeah, you guys get all that? London forces, their attractions between all types of molecules. Now, oh, something that's really important. When do less London forces occur between molecules? Always. There's always the influence of London forces, electrons moving. Okay? When are there dipole dipole forces occurring? Polar. Only in polar molecules. But now at the same time, if I have a polar molecule, do I have London forces? Yes. yes. Okay? What about hydrogen bonding? When does that occur? <laughs> when I have hydrogen, fluorine, nitrogen, and oxygen. And they're in that relationship where the positive and negative sides of those molecules come together. What's a great molecule that hydrogen bonds that makes it a wonderful universal solvent? Water, right? In fact, it causes all kinds of things in the world um, because of that. All right, so those are the three forces. I'll expect you guys to be able to identify those. This is just a longer list. Uh, what London forces are, dispersion forces. They're temporary. They're induced by molecules coming together. And so those electrons don't want to be next to each other. So what do they do? They shift, right? And so it causes regions of positive and negative charge, small negative and charge and positive and negative to form. All right, so they're very weak. And with molecules that are small, small molecules, Right? Those molecules are normally gases at room temperature, like methane, ethane, propane. You guys with me? When I get to butane, boy, I'm getting pretty close to being a liquid at room temperature, but it's pretty stinking volatile because I can put the liquid inside a, a small plastic container and then I can take a striker and I can strike. And what happens to the butane? It lights, doesn't it? I have a lighter. Right? Now, when I move one more, what do I get to? What's after butte? Pent. So I add one more carbon, mm, getting close to liquid at room temperature, very volatile. Hexanes, right? Liquid at room temperature. 
Still volatile though, right? What does that mean? That means that it moves into the vapor phase uh, because there's a low concentration in the air above it. And so as it evaporates, it moves out. And will that travel down benches and stuff like that ultimately can cause a fire in the laboratory? Yeah, I can. Okay. Other molecules like ethers, they do the same thing. They're fairly nonpolar. And so they're very volatile because of the relationship or interactions with each other. Okay. And if they're flammable and I have oxygen mixed into the room and give it a source. So understanding things like polarity, well, it's pretty important. Either that or you can just read the label and says flammable, right? Volatile and flammable. But isn't it better to actually just hear the name, know the structure, and be able to think, oh, well, this might be dangerous. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Oh, very little solubility in water, right? Because they're not charged, but a small amount can go in. And so this is a picture that the artist uses to illustrate London forces, right? Dispersion forces. And so anyway, partial positive, partial negative. And so those are sticky to each other and they hang out. All right. So boiling points of non-polar small molecules, right? On the far left, those are about as non-polar as you can get because they're single elements, they're called the noble gases. And even radon, which is massive, right? Even radon is still a gas at room temperatures, right? Things that are massive actually get sticky. Well, we can actually move over, let's talk about iodine, right? It's up here. What? phase is iodine in at room temperature? Yeah. Iodine? It's a solid. Yeah. Liquid or solid? Approaching that, right? So we make tinctures, we dissolve it into a solvent to make an iodine solution to treat wounds, right? Those types of things. It's easy to handle. Because of that, it's sticky and gooey. But, uh, but if we move up one to bromine, what we find is that in terms of its boiling point, it's about 59. Uh, when we move up the chlorine, which is much smaller, isn't it? Okay. Well, in fact, wait a minute. what I'm really talking about is the size of the molecule, right? And then there's another thing is that we are, each time we move down the period down a period on the periodic table, we add a, a layer of electrons. Would you guys agree with that statement? And so the nucleus is shielded by those, the positive charge in the nucleus is shielded by all those electrons. And so there's net less nuclear influence in that relationship because of those electrons out there, but it also allows them to shift more, right? So to make those regions stickier. Heck, bigger things are hard to move, aren't they? Yeah, so anyway, so that's what this is showing. And then it's showing the hydrocarbons. And so as we get larger and larger down this, then our boiling points continue to increase. Okay, cool? Yeah. Questions or comments? Never thought structure would bring you to this point to say what happens in boiling. What am I doing in terms of energy when I am trying to boil something? I increase it, right? If it's a liquid right now, it's currently a liquid, and I want to get it to boil away, what do I need to do? Heat it up. I need to put in energy, don't I? So I'm going to transfer energy in. What? Now, from your new perspective, what are you trying to overcome? the forces between the molecules, right? So you're trying to put in enough energy. And in fact, are those, the magnitude of those forces known by science? Yeah, we know the magnitude of those. And we also know that nonpolar things only have what type of forces between them? London forces, right? 
And so to overcome London forces, does it take less energy? It does, doesn't it? And so they have a tendency to have boiling points, right, at a lower temperature because you need less energy. Cool? You guys with me? Right. Now, this is assuming that the pressure remains constant. Can I change boiling points by, by changing the pressure on top of the liquid? Yeah, that's a force that's helping to hold it there, isn't it? Okay. And so if I lower the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, then it will boil at a lower temperature too. That's a whole different thing. Okay. We're talking about a constant pressure and those changes which occur. So no bonds are broken. We're going to add enough heat, which causes, well, wait a minute. What's a heat a measure of in molecules? Is it kinetic energy? The more heat that's there, the temperature goes up and the molecules move faster. And once they're moving, have enough kinetic energy to overcome their intermolecular attractions, then they leave, right? Now, I know I've asked this to you guys before, but if I have a container of water and I am boiling water in those bubbles, If I have water and I have added a flame to this, that's my nice flame here at the intercom, Bunsen burner, and I'm heating that, it is now bubbling. What's inside the bubbles? Water. water, right? You have taken molecules of water which are stuck together by London forces, right? And hydrogen bonding, and we put in enough energy that those hydrogen bonds have been broken, those London forces have been broken, and it allows those to leave in the gas phase, right? And it's water in the gas phase. All right, we always wanna make it something else. Always wanna make it oxygen or hydrogen or, so that means if I'm boiling ammonia, what's in the bubbles? Ammonia, right? If I'm boiling bromine. The bubbles are bromine. Okay? You, you guys with me? All right. So that's what happens when thing bo things boil. All right. So here's two same formulas. Write the formulas for both of those molecules. Write both the formulas for both of those molecules. What'd you find? It's the same formula. They have the same number of carbons. They have the same number of hydrogens. So what about their molecular weight? What does that mean for that? It's exactly same. What about the number of electrons present? It's exactly the same. You, you guys with me on all of that? So those molecules are identical in everything but structure, right? So this is a pentane is a straight chain, right? And 2,2-dimethylpropane is a branched molecule. You guys with me? So just that structural change can change the boiling point significantly. You guys with me? So the shape, it also changes the energy relationship and that higher branched molecules have a higher octane rating also. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's the name of the substances like this when they have the same formula but different structure? I know there's a name for it. They're isomers of each other. Yeah. So structural. Cool.
Dust him out of the time. Wow. What a great lecture. So, I'll open that house. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Okay? So, get some sunshine this afternoon.